educated, skilled, and living the good life. A black middle class that's giving new energy to South Africa's economy. This week, the emergence of the black diamonds and businesses that are growing with them. In 1994, political transformation lay at the center of change. Its shock waves could be felt across various sectors, most importantly education and business. The country's excluded non-white majority could finally benefit from shifting government policies. That brought about change in the curriculum in primary school and also in, in, in high school, that is say your elementary education, where the focus was also on business, the focus has been on mathematics. Wealth of knowledge and wealth of finance, two pillars that were supposed to provide economic freedom. But after two decades, the majority of blacks are still trapped in poverty. It started from policy. It's a lot of policies that the government came with. But in all those policies, some policies were not executed. We no longer have the patience to actually wait and see the weakness of a policy. We change it too rapidly before it can run its full course. And that, I think, is the reason why we are where we are. We are a very frustrated nation when it comes to policy. But to say South Africa hasn't changed at all post-apartheid wouldn't do the country justice. We've achieved wider access to health care, greater housing provision, and in the early 2000s, a sharp increase in GDP. This economic upturn also unexpectedly lifted a snippet of the population. They are young, energetic and aspirational. An emerging middle class, popularly known as the Black Diamonds. It's based on affordability. So you will probably afford to drive a better car, you will afford to, drive, you know, to have you know, a, a nice house. And some who were in business now, they, you know, they own their plots and then they own their farms, and then now they are living, yeah, like they are living large. So what is it that they've done that makes them so special? According to a 2013 University of Cape Town study, the buying power of this group has surpassed a staggering 400 billion rand per year. They're exposed to a different lifestyle. They even pick up new habits of traveling, uh, seeing the world, uh, things that your parents, because they didn't have extra cash, couldn't do. I think there is an exaggeration about the buying power. Maybe we should say their ability to attain a debt. Because if you look at their consumption pattern, you look at the debt, this is a highly indebted group of people. The Black Diamond's potential doesn't necessarily come from their wallets. Actually, this money tree is rooted in educational opportunities that came with the new dispensation. For instance, the merging of rich and poor tertiary institutions benefited particularly previously disadvantaged students. When you look at Rao or Rand African State University, they had resources and uh, massive resources and they could uh, afford to do a lot of things for their students and provide better education, research. When resources are skewed, it's very difficult to manage a system, but after measure we started to see a benefit. As the educational playing field is gradually leveling out, so too is the workforce. Affirmative action policies today largely favor the growth of skilled black professionals. 
but there's still a long way to go before the corporate sector fully transforms. If you look at the profile of staff in the public sector, for instance, public sector has been uh, transformed quite drastically uh, in terms of management, in terms of technical positions, really. Um, it's all, the challenge remains with the private sector. Uh, where you still have uh, a lot of resistance uh, by the white corporate sector to employ black people. The numbers may be disputable, but these entrepreneurs thrive on the spending of the black middle class. Soweto, always a hive of activity, a township known for setting new trends. Once home ground to the liberation struggle, today it's again driving South Africa in a new direction. In the front seat, an entrepreneur whose daring mentality is setting a new economic agenda. People want to make revenue and generate new revenue for themselves. People are tired of reporting to a boss every day. People are tired of clocking in and clocking out. People are tired. People want to be their own bosses. It is exactly this focused impatience that produced Homozo Bowe's success. His quad bike tours are just one part of a larger operation. His business has brought to Soweto a variety of recreational activities. A new kind of entertainment the township had previously never seen. You can find quad bikes anyway. It's a matter of just taking an idea somewhere else and putting it into your space and making it work in the space that you're in. Easier said than done. Shortly before he quit his job in 2010, Komoto had a long discussion with his brother, Subing, about his new business idea. He basically saw an insert about soccer players doing quad biking one, two, and three. And it was a case of Subing, what's your take on that? The brothers noticed an obvious lack of fun things to do in their township. So they used their savings to buy a few quad bikes and leased a piece of land, thinking people would flock in with excitement. They didn't accept it because it's not a black thing to do. People didn't think black people would buy into the quad biking business in a sense. The Bowe brothers weren't the only ones facing this rejection. Another set of entrepreneurs in the early 2000s tried testing in townships a business that suited a wealthier lifestyle. If you want to buy labels on clothes, if you're buying the labels of whiskey, which people are doing, then the next step is I want to drink wine because that is socially acceptable with food. Yes, wine, the stylish beverage of choice for the upper class. Marilyn Cooper and her business partner Mnikelo Mangnipu wanted Soweto to have a taste of the high life. It would come in the form of an annual wine festival. The objective was to demystify the negative uh, perceptions about wine especially in the black areas. Again, easier said than done. History tells us that uh, wine is not a traditional drink for blacks, so they were very skeptical that uh, is it a wise move. But if such a radical idea didn't have swaying power, then word of mouth would have to be the answer. I used to go to parties, and if I saw a black face, I would say, oh, please come to my festival, please come to my festival. <laughs> like Mnikelo and Marilyn, Homozo Bowe used a similar tactic to attract clients. Word of mouth, but geared for the digital age. All I did is go to my Facebook profile, and I was going on about how it's going down in the hood, guys. You're the quad bike and it's full. Don't miss out. Hey, it's really, really happening. Come through. There was nobody. It was just me and no clients. You know what I mean? 
Gradually, this marketing strategy worked like a well-oiled machine. And there was a distinct demographic to his new client base. Our first three months of business were black people from Soweto, or black people from Pretoria, or black people from Alexandra, or black people from Tembisa. Five years on, Komoto's business has grown from quad biking to a multitude of activities in Gauteng and the Western Cape. And remember how Mnikelo Mangnipu was told that a township wine festival wouldn't work? Well, here it is today. Drawing only 1,500 people in 2004, it's now exploded into a three-day event, attracting a crowd of more than 6,500 in 2015. And the lifeblood of both businesses is the new money from a growing black middle class. Of the 90% of people who attend, I would say 50% of that actually live in Soweto. But the others, of course, don't live in Soweto. They live in all the suburbs, and they see our posters, and they come back to Soweto to party on a weekend. I think it's the growth of the middle class in itself only, but it's also the growth of intellectually-minded black people to say, we've got to start doing things differently. 